put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. If the video is simply too long for you, I did record a shorter version and the link is in the description box. Thief, Deadly Shadows, Video Game Review. Garrett Returns, and with this one focusing on the city, including its origins and the Keepers, he is sort of recruited by the Keepers. And they have him steal some MacGuffins, and then he listens in on a prophecy, which he and we find vague, and then he keeps working for them. And there are these hints of the coming Dark Age, which is said to be the child of ignorance and fear, these two fathers. So the Republicans warned us, and yeah, it's just this ominous sounding dark age, very soon after the metal age, by the by, and where the metal age did, you know, it has a certain connotation. It Metal not being, not being human, and being unbending, being very harsh. And dark is just, yeah, it's, it's rather vague, and uh, frankly the plot remains quite vague for the majority of this with, I mean it does, it starts very soon, but it's, it's very vague and doesn't really grab our interest and when something finally does happen, it's far too little and much too late. Now, before I get into the negatives, I will say there's a lot of good here. I've, as I've already hinted at, this is not up to the level of the first two, but with the first two being so freaking amazing, the fact that it doesn't quite reach the same level doesn't mean that it's not still pretty good. The shadow and, or rather light and noise based stealth returns and is in some way improved here. Basically, noise and the how much light there is and how much noise you or something else is making determines whether you are being hidden or whether you are revealing your presence. And sometimes making noise can be useful. If you make some noise as the, you know, make some noise and then sneak to a different area, you may be able to lure a guard away from his post and the, the guards themselves also reveal themselves by maybe you see their shadow from around the corner or the like and you hear them, you might hear their footsteps or if they're standing still you may hear, they might, they might cough or whistle or mumble to themselves. And in this one, every object and every character has its own dynamic shadow. Literally, it moves according to the light. And the various objects and surfaces are even more detailed in how light and sound travel. So if if, if a door is closed or a window is closed, the sound won't transmit as easily 
as if it isn't. And guards will notice if something is suddenly open or closed when it shouldn't be, and they might go and check on it. It also depends on just regular NPCs, civilians, won't necessarily check, but they might alert someone to check. And the and in addition, you know, light may travel, you know, if you open a door and there's a light source, it might travel through, you know, into the other room. And the various surfaces that you walk on and the like, you know, from you know, carpet to wood to stone in, in order of least to most noisy. And sometimes you may want to jump, and jumping and then landing on the surface creates a significant amount of noise compared to just walking. And of course, the speed with which you are walking also determines how loud how loud your footsteps are. And with that, at the same time, you have to watch whether you are in in the light. You know. It's, yeah, the, the guards are real divas like that. You know, they they don't watch in the light, and basically there are a ton of tiny little safe spots around the game, and you are always moving through. Uh, let's go to no man's land, where you will be discovered, and you know if if you're making noise or you know, walking through, you know, walk into the light. Yeah, you're, you're moving from one safe area to another all the time. The developers of the first two have likened it to a submarine, powerful when hidden, but vulnerable when exposed. Now, the... To, to get right to the, the core of the issue here. Basically, with, with Looking Glass Studios going under, yeah, that is, that is something that keeps me up at night. Ion Storm took over, and I do... So, so yes. Thief was the, the third Thief game here was developed by the makers of Deus Ex 1 and 2. So, you know, basically, you got Deus Ex in my Thief, you got Thief in my Deus Ex. Two great tastes that really do not go together. I do really want to highlight that I love Deus Ex and I love Thief. Probably Thief slightly more than Deus Ex, but I do love Deus Ex. It's just that they really don't go together. And this and that kind of just spreads out and, and encompasses all of it. Pretty much every aspect in the game is in some way affected by the Deus Ex-ness that Ion Storm brought to Thief. And I'm not gonna list them all, you know. Right now, I'll get to them as I cover the various aspects of the game. Now, a good place to start is with the three factions. The Starting with the Keepers, who are by far the most prominent, and that in and of itself is a bit of a problem, the keepers here seem planless and impotent, constantly needing Garrett, sometimes even to do very, to accomplish very basic tasks. And in, in general, this really sort of tries to put Garrett up on a pedestal. pedestal. I mean, he is an amazing thief. He, he may very well, he, he probably is the best thief. And the first two games do very much point to that as well, but in those he is also up against significant forces, and here the the way that Garrett 
seems better than everybody else is that things just happen to fall into his lap. And the the ease with which he you accomplish things, yeah, just makes everybody else feel completely useless. So to get back to the, the keepers, they are <coughs> excuse me, they are no longer guides. It, it frankly reverses the you know like I said, they're, they're pointless, they're impotent, and they're no longer guides. It's the exact reverse of the keepers from the first two games. And they also lack mystery. We see them too much, they talk too much, and we, you know, we get too many details. Everybody in this game talks too much. Everybody but the undead. And frankly, I wouldn't have been surprised if the undead did start talking in this. The pagans pretty much master the English language. They, they just have a little bad grammar. They keep talking about bees. Bees. My god. Not the bees. And yeah, everybody talks. And talks constantly. Talks about everything relating to them. The, the pagans no longer feel just chaotic and like nature is they're, they're basically, they're so close to nature that they're almost not even human anymore. They are, they are so close to their roots. And I do mean roots in the very literal sense. In the first two games, you have just man-sized cockroaches and rat people and the like. And here, the pagans are pretty much just human beings. And the Hammerites don't have the oppressive discipline that they had at first. The, the worship of machinery. I mean, these aspects are still here, but they feel like lip service. The pagan territories are not as... This is not a spoiler. You visit... Basically, two of the first missions take you to the Hamorites and the pagans. And it, in some ways, almost feels like they're just getting them out of the way because they really aren't that there's not that much focus on them for the rest of the game. But yeah, the... And, and even with the Keepers taking the forefront, I'd still say they should have much more of an impact. Now, the... Yes, the, the Hammerites... They just... The Hammerites and the Pagans, where they used to feel like extremes barely coexisting. Now they feel like rivaling companies in engaged in friendly competition. The as natural as the, the human movements now are, everybody moves like a human. Everybody can walk and run again, including the undead. There's no that was something that was it felt odd that there were undead, especially so many in the first thief, but at least they were very clearly undead. You know, the, the old, you know, kind of zombies. Had the, the Dawn of the Dead remake come out by the time this was, I guess it may just have by, by some months or so. I believe this was re released in the same year as, as that, so maybe they were just keeping up with the times, but nevertheless. I'm not going to get into the should zombies war or should they run. Basically, the various creatures in this, and by the way, the designs also tend to be bland and or derivative, the various creatures in this tend to move at the same rate as the humans do. And yeah, it just it feels like a reskin, not a completely different life form. And, and, and for the pagans, nature no longer springs to life and attacks you. It, yeah, it feels like the creatures that are there are just there because it's expected of the pagans. They don't feel organic. Now, the, all three of, of these factions, keepers, pagans, and hammerites, also very much... All of them have t tend to be populated by human guards, human beings in general, and the, the various 
people who might attack you have you know wands, bows, and swords. You know, one of each per person. And the again, they were, they were magic users in the first two, but now they just feel like they're all over the place. They 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 get to feel common, and that really. Yeah, that, that isn't good. Now, I suppose that more or less covers the various factions in the immediate. Now, there is, there, there is again some exploration of the master-servant relationships with, you know, those not in charge. You know, maybe complaining a bit about the terms, terms under which they work, or the, you know, two servants might, you know, talk together about how the, yeah, the, the terms just don't, you know, yeah, aren't, aren't very friendly towards the, yeah. Actually, one more thing on the factions, the steam-driven machines of the first two are no longer very present in the city itself. They are, they are there in some, in, in some of the more Hamorite-based areas, but yeah, it, it, the, the city doesn't feel that much like the city anymore, and that's another thing. This one, they bring in the open world sort of thing of Deus Ex, and more, more to the point, Deus Ex 2, Deus Ex Invisible War where the open world is not quite an open world, it's a series of fairly small areas that are connected by, you know, loading areas where, yeah, and the levels now are about a fourth of the size that they were in the first two, and that, again, is a pretty substantial downgrade. And yeah, the one thing is that Thief really shouldn't have open world. It shouldn't have, and I don't, again, the, the levels should be very nice and open, and they are still fairly open in this, but the, there shouldn't be a city to actually go and explore, you know, and it's, it's, Thief is too atmosphere heavy and the story focus is too substantial for it to really work in a open world setting. And to be fair, there is some, there is some effect of these aspects in Deus Ex as well in the open world. But Deus Ex also has far more different areas to a city. It, it really doesn't help that there's only the one city here, and that's, uh, that's not a spoiler. That is, the Thief world really only has the city. You know, there's, there's within the city, and then there's outside of the city, but we're never told, you know, it's, it's Mega City 1, basically. You know, everybody lives in the city. And again, I, I'm not saying they should have had more cities, I'm saying having straight up exploration of the city just mm, like this doesn't really work for Thief. But yeah, Deus Ex, you know, you, you explore Hong Kong, Paris, New York, and each of these are distinct from each other, have the, the personality of that city. And, you know, in part what we, you know, what we think of those cities being today, 
and also in part being this, you know, I think cyberpunk is, is the term where it's, and, and this, you know, slightly futuristic kind of, you know, you know, setting as far as time goes, where, you know, there is, there's a bit more totalitarianism going on than, than even today in big cities. And when it was made, there, were, there wasn't a lot of totalitarianism. There wasn't a lot of that going around back when the, the Deus Ex games were made. But, yeah, the, the thing here is, to, to get into, like, a Deus Ex, just a, a single city of Deus Ex, in addition to houses, barracks, and shops, which are also here. You know, you have a hotel, a subway, a shipping and receiving firm, you know, all these in addition, and, and this is, did I mention, this is the one city. This is just one of these three cities that have all of these things. There's so much personality to the cities of Deus Ex. And really, Thief, the city itself doesn't have that many different personalities, that, that much flavor to it. It's the... The variety of the thief world comes a lot when you leave the city or when you go to very specific areas of the city, such as Hamlite you know, sections. That's another thing. What are the pagans doing in the city in this? That is just... If, even if they had more... more power, if, if, even if they and the Hamorites weren't completely, you know, knocking heads, which they aren't in this, at least not to the extent of, of the first two, I still couldn't see it. Pagans would not want to be in the city. That is, that is part of the point. Now, I suppose that more or less covers the overall issues with the city exploration. In addition to that, we have a, you know, to, to go more into, into detail about the city. Like I said, you have basically there are shops and then there are fences. And at fences, you sell the loot that you grab from, you know, the, the previous mission. You also now get to keep both loot and equipment between machines, which I can appreciate that it doesn't necessarily make complete sense that you lose it all between missions, but I do think it was a nice, it was a good limiting factor. It, it disempowers the player some, and that's really important in stealth. And in this, Frankly, I found myself using the, the various items and equipment so little that the, the shops didn't really have much of anything to offer me. The, and and I'll, I'll admit, you know, I am the type to not use these things all that much, but yeah, it's still just, in, in the first two, Given that you you know that once the mission is over, you're gonna lose all of this stuff. Like the the stuff you stole, the loot can be used to buy equipment for the next mission, which also always presses you to do well. Which in this, if you don't spend that much money and you loot well for the first couple of levels, you don't necessarily have to loot that much more, depending on the difficulty setting. But I'll get to that. But yeah, you, you really might as well use up all the equipment you had. And that was a fun kind of... Yeah, it's, it's good when stealth games really say, you have this and that's it, you know, deal with it, make it work for you. And 
yeah. So that pretty well covers the shops and the fences. In addition, you can spy on the townspeople, you can break into any building you come across, and the, you can you can go to more areas of the city as you progress through the game. You can steal from catchers by on the street, and you can mug them. Now the that actually brings me very nicely into you can always pickpocket. Basically, you just gotta be close enough and maybe make yourself scarce once you pickpocket it. Because people are gonna notice, which is really cool. That's that's a really cool addition that you know you can still pickpocket, they, they might have a purse or the key to an area, and the, the keys are now entirely optional. They basically there are shortcuts that mean you don't have to, you know, pick the lock on that particular door. But you can pick the lock of any door that you have to pass through now. So, which again, you know, it puts power back into the hands of the player when stealth games are very much about disempowering the player, and it's good that they disempower the player. That you know. That's part of the point of a stealth game. Yeah, you know, to, to challenge as much as possible. Anyway, you so so those are some of the things you can pickpocket. Now you can also grab the wand right off their belt. Like I mentioned, all the all three factions have wand carriers, and now. You can disarm them if if they haven't already noticed you, and you again it's gonna be excuse me it's gonna be noticed. But if you if you expect to fight them at least, you can steal the wand, and they'll basically at least a lot of the ones I encountered were then defenseless and then ran off to get someone else. Now the I suppose that more or less covers the city itself. The uh, I suppose the final thing about the city is it has actually before I get to that one thing that's also really problematic about introducing open world segments into Thief is that when you're just walking the streets. The City Watch are really the only ones that for sure are looking for you and are coming for your lunch money. Everybody else is really... Civilians are not going to bother you at all unless you try to mug them or if maybe, you know, if you pick their pocket, they might run to the City Watch. And, yeah. But apart from that, you can just be wandering the streets and that really isn't thief. That I, I can't even imagine Garrett just wandering the streets, you know, comfortably. It just, you know, maybe it happens, but you know, it's it's like Navajas in Desperado. We never hear him talk. Okay, we see him dial the you know, with those bad little knives. You know, dial the phone to call. I, I maintain he is a telepath, he is using, and, and, the, and the phone helps him transmit it further. We never hear him talk. In my mind, the man does not talk. Maybe he does, but I don't want to see it. I don't want to think about it. And Garrett does not ever not sneak. That is just not Garrett. That was a lot of nodding. I don't want to see it. I don't want to hear about it. It doesn't exist. And yeah, Gary does not does not really have a safe place to be. You know, go to your happy place, Gary. That does not happen. Should not happen. And until this did not happen, and yeah, it just it takes away from it. And then you have you know you you lose some of the story focus, which yeah, and and they're surprisingly linear. They. Yes. 
And that brings me to, there are bases for the, the three factions. And basically, like I said, you're, you're working for the Keepers, for at least some of this. Not going to give away how much, but from very early on, you're working for the Keepers. And you can ally yourself with the other two factions. Both, neither, or one of them. It's entirely up to you. It just, when you're allied with a faction, it means you can go to their base and, you know, the, yeah, they're, they're not going to bother you. If they're just neutral, you know, won't have no trouble, but it's not going to, They're, they're, yeah, they're not going to let you into their base. And, and obviously, to remain allied with them, you don't hurt any of them, and you don't steal from them. And the, you know, and, and if they're not allied or neutral, they might be hostile. And if you pass one on the street, they will put the hurt on you if, if they're hostile. So. Yeah, well, when they're allied, they will fight on your behalf if, yeah. So they might also fight each other because they are, which, which really makes me wonder why they both, why you can ally yourself with both. It's like, do they not keep tabs on, well, Garrett is hard to keep tabs on, but do they really not care whether or not Pierre is, you know, two-timing them with another faction. It just, yeah, I suppose that more or less covers that aspect. And there might be fights around the city independent of you, although one of the two, you know, one, one of the groups involved, sometimes more than two, one of the groups involved will probably be fighting against you or for you. And, you know, the others, yeah, I think that pretty well covers that without giving too much, too much away either, but, yeah. I'm not sure I really see Garrett straight up allying himself with a faction for a, I mean, he's, he might work with them, but it's a, the the enemy of my enemy the enemy of my friend is my enemy kind of thing you know it's they're not gonna be bosom bodies is what I'm buddies is what I'm saying they they yeah and here it it does kind of yeah and and it also ends up feeling tacked on because when you go into their territory for missions, all bets are off. They're going to attack you. And I get that. I'm, I'm not saying that they should let you into the, the deepest recesses of their territory. I'm saying if you're going to send me into the deepest recesses of their territory, then don't give me an option to ally with them. That doesn't, does not compute, you know. Now, the whenever you move between areas, there is this mist denoting the, the the passage. And given that conflict started on one side won't carry over to the other, makes me wonder if only I can see the mist, if it's like only Garrett perceives the mist and the others are just like, where'd he go when when you pass into there? I mean, at, at least Hitman Absolution does make you deal with the, the situation before you just cross over into the unknown, before you pass on to the next, you know, next area in, in the level. And actually, that does bring up the, for, for the open world, 
the hitman is a stealth game that I could see working in an open world because there are so many distinct cities around the world, areas in general around the world with the where, where each has its own atmosphere and personality and as such I could see that working out where you know Thief and Deus Ex, it's always bleak, it's always at night and, and this kind of thing again Deus Ex fares better I cover that and it's you know, going on to levels, games that have straight up, you know, proper open world, what I would call proper open world. Games like Assassin's Creed and Grand Theft Auto, the atmosphere is not as not as strong as it, basically in those games. Everything is, you know, it might be daytime, it might be nighttime. There's weather changes, you know, and the character will move around the the, the basic area, you know, the, the the city or the outskirts or what have you. And the 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 story focus is less it just it doesn't feel like you have to rush into the next mission, which Deus Ex and Thief do feel like, and the and and then you get into you know in in those games being you know being allied with someone or working with someone doesn't mean that you constantly have to worry about it. like in in both Thief and Deus Ex when you're in someone's territory, you do have, and, and in general, when working with someone, if you hurt someone that is just like a civilian, you know, it's it might turn the the nearby guards against you, even if you were a law-abiding citizen up to that point. And in Grand Theft Auto, for example, you know, you can do whatever you want. It, if you break the law, the police are going to come get you. But that's about it. You know, if you're not breaking the law, you know, or, or out on a mission that has police coming in, that's it. And Assassin's Creed also, I mean, basically it, it sort of prevents you from killing civilians. And in addition to that, you are, you know, in Grand Theft Auto and Assassin's Creed, you kind of are a criminal. So the fact that the police might come after you doesn't mean that much. And Garrett as well is a criminal, but again, I feel like I covered that earlier. Why why it still doesn't work. Now the I went into earlier, I, I mentioned earlier that everybody talks too much. In the first two, it's very much I mean the, the only people who really talk a lot are the you know guards and civilians and the like. It's not really the it's not plot information so much. And in this it is. In in this people will just constantly yeah constantly be talking about what's going on. So so when you're listening in or reading documents, they they spell things out. It's especially the problem. Sometimes they even repeat themselves. There were times where I you know eavesdropped on a conversation and then went to read or vice versa and it was the exact same information. And I can appreciate, you know, okay, maybe not everybody eavesdrops. Okay, so maybe they don't get that information. The Thief games, the first two, are very much about if you pay attention, you get everything. If, if you also piece together things. It's a lot of tiny little hints that you have to piece together if, if you care. Garrett does not care. It's entirely up to the player. Garrett is not going to explain anything 
He cares about his own neck, and that's it. That's why we love him. And in this, the game just goes to great lengths to make sure that we understand everything that is going on. And, yeah, it's just, it really doesn't fit Thief. The you know a lot of it becomes white noise because it's repetitive and spells things out. It even it provides like it reminds you of things that happened in the first room, even when they don't necessarily have a lot of impact on what's happening now. And I mean, this is always a thing with sequels: how much do you repeat and the like. It's maybe especially because the first two were so much you have to piece things together that it feels really off that here they're just listing what happened in, in the previous games. It also really doesn't help that a lot of this stuff is just really bland. You know, in, the, in addition to just being a lot of time being exposition dumps and such, it's just it's not that well written text or dialogue. There, there were time. At one point, I literally found a lexicon. It was like we've reached self-parody. This is this has got to be an in joke, or, or this is yeah. The, the developers did not have faith in the players' abilities to piece together, or their willingness to. And again, you can play the first two games and not care about what's going on. That is your prerogative. The game does not hinge on whether or not you're paying attention to the overall plot. Garrett isn't. He gets by. You can too. I mean, when it actually, when there's something that you really have to make sure you do, or that you really, it doesn't really require you to know. Like, yeah, the the really big events. It's just okay if if this group does that. Bad result. So, yeah, I want to prevent that. So, and that's enough, you know, if you don't want to dive into the world. And, yeah. Now, I suppose that more or less covers that. I see, again, I, I understand where it comes from because Ion Storm were making Deus Ex games. So, it I don't completely blame them for this being so Deus Ex E, but Thief and Deus Ex are two very different beasts. And in this in this area, for example, is that Deus Ex has a very intricate both plot and backstory and dozens of independent groups working within you know the factions. And if you're not, it, it takes a lot of exposition. It just does. You know, exposition is it can be a little, a little awkward and, and clunky sometimes. But a game, as you know, games as heavy and as loaded as the three Deus Ex games, the two of which were done by Armstrong, Armstrong before this came out. You do need. To have a lot of exposition, you do need to really spell out this is what's happening, this is what has happened, because there is so much and it all works together. There are so many different plot strands that come together, so many different end games and motivations. And again, that that is not to say that Thief is simple. Thief is very much a a very direct, very concentrated experience in that, you know, Deus Ex is the, you know, Deus Ex 1, for example, brings in pretty much every major conspiracy theory. Pretty much. I'm, I'm, I almost defy you to, to bring up a conspiracy theory that had been into, I mean, they have, you know, there's no, there's no Benghazi and, and truther kind of stuff in there, but that came later. The, the stuff, the, the conspiracy theories that were 
thought up before Deus Ex 1 came out are pretty much all in Deus Ex 1. And that's, you know, they, they attempt to bring in all of these different things where Thief is very much, we take just a few factions and a little bit of sugar. Let's dive completely into what does that mean? What does that mean? Play them out. I don't know what that means. So doing it live, what exactly do we get out of a faction that is entirely of nature, that is entirely chaotic? There is no, there is no order. There is no real progress. They are all about nature. So things grow from nature, and nature is very much. We we need some nature. We we can't be completely, you know, cut off. From nature, but nature itself is also a very volatile beast. It's, it's, I think that's what they also say about Cthulhu. They don't, nature does not care about your well being. That is not what nature does. Nature exists and it keeps itself alive. It, you know, we're talking, we're talking evolution, we're talking survival of the fittest. You are not necessarily going to like the outcome, but it's going to be the nominee. It's going to be the outcome, is what I'm saying. Whereas the... And, and then on the other side, we have the Hamrites. What is order and discipline? How far does that go? And in the first one, you're reading my... You, one of the first levels of the first one, you're breaking into a prison, you know, because your fence is in there, and he had better not. Garrett wants payment. Garrett did a job, Garrett demands payment. Garrett is going to get that fence and get his payment. Plain and simple. You're reading about you know, the, the various punishments that these people are, are suffering. And it's, it's Old Testament kind of punishment. Cut off the hand. You know, gouge out eyes. Because, I mean, they stole something or they, you know, and, and it's things where we're like, that is awful, that is, but that's discipline. That is discipline to its furthest extreme. And the first two games take these different extremes and then say, okay, what, what happens when these clash? And what, just and exploring that, that is what Thief is. And that's not what Deus Ex is. And both are great. But this takes the Deus Ex approach to a thief sensibility, and it just does not work out. Part of the thing here is that they... I could have respected if this game was Deus Ex with Garrett, but they, do, they go for some thief, and they go for some Deus Ex, and they don't fully... They don't completely go down either road. It ends up somewhere in, in the middle and ends up not from a technical standpoint a bad game, but a very unmemorable and bland one. Now, I suppose that more or less covers that. So the missions themselves, you are infiltrating an area, accomplishing something, and then you exfiltrate. And when I say accomplish something, where the first game, sometimes it was not really about you sneaking in somewhere. It was just you had to find your way through this area and then, you know. And then the second one, it was like, okay, you guys are right. We're going to keep it to the, the urban areas. But if, if we do that, stealing alone can't be the full thing. So let's think up some other different, you know, stealthy objectives that you can. So you're you're you know you're eavesdropping. You're you know you're you're following someone. You're performing sabotages. In this one, it's almost all stealing. 
And given that it's almost all urban, it doesn't really work out that, that well. It, it feels very repetitive and almost uninspired. Anyway, yes, you're, you're moving through the levels. And while definitely no one area in this is as memorable as those of the you know, as several are in the first two games, they do tend to be fairly decently put together. And there are memorable sort of overall locations. You go to a church, you explore caves. At one point, you go into a clock tower and you're moving around these gears that, if you get too close, they are going to crush you. You know, and yeah, there are, there are some pretty cool, you know, different locations there. And you are, of course, you know, trying to find out, you know, de determining the different patrol paths where, and where are guards standing and, you know, how can I sneak up on them and, and such. I believe you can even ghost it. I didn't completely manage to ghost the entire game, but ghosting it means, you know, for the uninitiated to be all snobby and such. Basically, you're not you're not knocking anybody out, you're not killing anyone, you more or less leave it as it were. You you go undiscovered and without knocking anyone out or, or the like. Of course, if you knock someone out, in my case, when knocking someone out, you'll want to hide the body and this again you know, do so in the shadows and keep them away from patrol paths because, yeah, that that will attract attention. There's, you know, there's no better way to kill the mood of a party than for a dead guy to show up. You know, un unless, of course, I mean, Weekend at Bernie's, well, not to be fair, those two movies really do suck the fun out of, of any kind of party atmosphere. Why did I watch that second one? Because it was during the middle of the night, couldn't sleep, it was on TV anyway. Yes. Now, the... I suppose that brings me nicely into... The AI is pretty good. The basically there, there are a couple of different states they of, of suspicion and the like, and they will you know they will give chase. They will if if they see something that isn't as it should be, they will check out the area. This is again this is something you have to watch out for, but also something you can use to your advantage if you want the guy to leave his post and go over, you know, maybe leave a door open, you know, this this kind of thing. It's, yeah, and, and sometimes you may need them to leave that post just for you to knock them out. And at the same time, if they are too, you know, if their situational awareness does not kind of suck, they will not allow you to just instantly knock them out with the, the blackjack, which I've nicknamed mine here at Cantor. Or the, you know, you can also backstab. And both of these are just, you know, you hit them once, that's it, you know. And killing is always less stealthy. It, it you know, there's blood, so much blood, and you do also have to, you know, someone screams out if they're being killed, even if it's very fast. And if I wasn't talking about a video game, that would sound so bad, so disturbing, and yet it still kind of does. So yeah, that will attract attention, of course, and yeah. 
this is it's still very much about remaining hidden and if you if you're discovered it might be better to flee than you know you, you really don't want to straight up fight them you, you still have the flash bomb but you know taking a hit is obviously a very sobering experience because it will immediately end the dazzled effect of the flash bomb you also can't now blind yourself with a flash bomb but yeah so it, it, you can't knock anyone out or insta kill anyone once you flash bomb them and again if they're all at all aware of you also not so it really is only when when they really aren't particularly aware that there's someone there. It's it's if they are investigating something that's just a little bit off, that, that should maybe be in a different way. Now, yes, that it's still very much not about fighting. Now, what are the first two had you wield a sword, which you could genuinely fence with. You know, there are different types of sword strikes. You could block enemy swords. In this, it's replaced with a dagger, which I will admit does make more sense to carry. As an unarmed, fast, sneaky thief, you know, given that you're not this heavily armored, you know, great fighter guard kind of person, but it does also mean that once discovered, if you want to use the dagger, it's just a one strike and you just got to hit them over and over again. Yeah, that's it's one of many cases, and I'm not talking about this game specifically, where a stealth game, in an effort to disempower the player, does end up with an awkward mechanic. You know, it is play Splinter Cell 1 and then tell me that being meleeed to death, you know, just the, the, the actually maybe it's been, it's been too long. Maybe it's that you, when you're trying to melee, it's, it's just about useless. But yeah, it sometimes ends, ends up awkward. And that's, you know, that is something that sometimes happen, happens when stealth games do go to lengths. So I appreciate that they're at least disempowering. Now, when trying to knock out or insta-kill, you do now get a visual cue, which is great. That was something that really did... you could sometimes miss and refresh to. And the, the visual cue is in both first and third person now. The purest in me does really disapprove of the third person view in spite of its handy 360 degree camera, but you are never forced to use it. It's entirely up to the individual player. So, and it, it does open it up to more people. So, I suppose that's something that that is something. The game goes more mainstream. The the first two games are kind of off in the. I mean, they do go kind of. They they take something and they just run with it. And a lot of people, it's it's some something of a niche. You know. Yeah. Not 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 everybody is going to is is going to like it. Everybody can sit down and play it, but not everybody's going to end up liking it. But I and and you know, obviously that's part of why Looking Glass went under. It's the these very specific you know, thief and system shock is not for everyone. And then you have the graphics argument because you know, can't possibly play a game that doesn't have top-notch graphics. Let's, you know, go spend our money on generic crap, which looks nice. I'm getting off topic. 
I've done more than enough videos ranting about the, the... Although I could always make more, but not this one. Basically, yeah, this one goes a bit more mainstream. This is also very, vis very visible in the cutscenes, which are now often in-engine and very meh. They're, they're not very impressive. And, you know, in-engine cutscenes are seldom that compelling, but it's especially when, when it's this, you know, again, such heights before this one. And then it's not bad, but it's just not on the same level as before. Even when it is, you know, these more... Yeah, when, when it's just fully animated and such, it's a bit more mainstream with the angles. You know, they, they do still sometimes use silhouette, but they're showing faces entirely too much. I do not want to see Garrett's face that much. It's not, you know... I'm not saying he's a bar face, I'm just... Before, we pretty much only saw, like, his eyes a little bit. He wears a cloak for a reason, of, you know, he's got the hoodie, you know. Better hope he doesn't run into George Zimmerman, but... <laughs> There's a reason, he, he's trying to cover his, his features. And it's again, we're, we're not talking Phantom of the Opera, but he is trying to not be discovered. The, the 360 degree camera really doesn't help in, in that respect. But before we, I mean, okay, he was on, you know, the covers, the, the cover art for the first two, but we didn't see him constantly like, like we do here. He's even on, on the loading screens now, so yeah, at least they do give him a, a, a nice, you know, scar, which I'm not going to give away how he got it, but if you're familiar with the overall history of these games, the, the plot, then you too know why that is. Now, I suppose that one of those covers... Actually, yeah, the... They do sometimes use silhouette and get more, more gothic and, and surreal in these cutscenes. But it's, it's definitely not often enough. And it's, it's again very much, over the first two were very much about creating an atmosphere and you have to piece together what exactly it was you just saw. It, it's not going to spell it out for you. In this, it's very much... It's handheld, but not in the way of a handheld camera. You know, they're, they're making sure you know exactly what just happened and how the exact, yeah. And briefings now are just text, I mean, narrated by Garrett, at least, still. But in the first two, he would narrate his basic plan and, and what he knew about it. But it would also have these detailed animations of, like, you know, the, the, the map of the overall area, you know, the, the enemy unit, the guards, and the like. And, yeah, just, again, creating an atmosphere. The, the first two games are all atmosphere all the time. In this one atmosphere, distant second, maybe a third. Now, the this does, in some ways, streamline. This plays a lot like a an even more streamlined Essex in this war with Garrett as the protagonist, and that again is very unfortunate in that. Again, Deus Ex really needed to have a certain... It had to be somewhat tangible because of all these different factions and this intricate plot. And Thief is really not 
like that. It's, it's okay if you don't know everything that's going on. And, for example, when you're going around the various, the, the city, and just exploring and the like, you know, you can break into the same areas, for example. You know, it'll, it'll with, you know, there, there'll be some exploring of the city, and then there'll be a mission, and, like, Exploring the city and a mission might be a whole day, and then the next day, you know, some areas get restocked, some don't. Yeah. And when you're just, excuse me, excuse me, picking the same box and the like, I mean, this is something I really love about Deus Ex, going to these areas and, you know, they might change the lock, and it'll be more powerful. Or part of it is also that there are more different ways to to open things, which again, thief doesn't need. But in Deus Ex, you know, in addition to lock picks, you have multi tools, which in Deus Ex Invisible War are combined with lock picks, which you shouldn't ever made a video about that. Multi tools, you can maybe you know, find the actual key to open. Maybe you need a key to, you know, or at least it'll say the lock picks. Maybe you blow it open, you know, and it'll tell you, you know, okay, this one maybe can't be blown open, but the lock strength, whatever, you know, maybe it can be blown open and the, the strength of the material is so and so, and yeah. And in this, it's it's only the lockpick, and it doesn't really, it doesn't highlight that Thief is not complex enough, because it is. It highlights that Deus Ex, the Deus Ex approach should not be used for Thief. Now, some areas that get streamlined, the compass is not always visible. It, it becomes part of the light meter, which the light meter shows, it, it sort of brightens when you're running. I really wish it wouldn't do that, because it, sometimes you're running across carpet, and it's difficult to tell if the light meter is telling you that it's actually bright, or it's just, oh, right, I was running. Okay, now I've slowed down. Yeah, it just, it, you can listen for the, you know, or if they maybe had at least done the, you know, put in the, the splinter cell noise indicator, which is more important than splinter cell because there will actually be areas that where something natural makes noise, like a machine running, and then you can make more noise. But anyway, other areas, it, it sort of, it speeds it up a little. I think some have called it more combat-based I can see it as it's it's more like overtly for you know okay maybe you have to flee or yeah or or maybe you just took damage so you got a real quick heal basically you no longer have to scroll past the 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 loot and the you know you you can't store like foods the way you could before, so strong past those either. Objective items also don't, you know, you can look up objective items in the menu, and keys, so on and so forth. You know, you can look up keys, you can look up objective items, and the, I'm not sure you can look up the loot while you're in the level, Possibly, but certainly you can when you're going to fences because you know each fence has something they won't buy and such. So you gotta go to different ones to sell it all. Yeah, and and you know the different shops may not all have the same items. You get the idea. It's it's your basic shop kind of system, and again it's it's fine, but it's not quite a thief, and it's also just not as. <laughs> 
don't know. It, it really didn't need to be. I mean, when you're buying equipment for missions in the first two, you just have a bunch of stuff to select between, and then the loot you grab in the level before it. And it didn't really need a face on the other side. Is you know. Anyway, the and the loot will also show in percentage in the you know in the objective menu. So you're no longer scrolling past that. When you're scrolling through items, it's the stuff you use in let's just let's go with combat situations. Basically, your healing potion, flash bombs, you know, the the explosive mine, yeah, these these kinds of things, and yeah, it makes it. It doesn't mean that you're constantly fighting, but it does mean that when you need something like that, it's easier to get to, and that's really useful. And the and and when you and and use item and interact are now on two separate keys, which I do appreciate. In the first two, it was more streamlined, but it was maybe almost excessively streamlined. It's the kind of thing where the first two were very much, you can sit down and just play it. You might not get good at it for a while, but you can sit down and play it. And in this, it goes a little more towards, you know, what's maybe a little Better. I can't believe I just said something negative about it. And when you just press, you know, use item in inventory, it will bring up the flash bomb. It won't throw a flash bomb immediately, but it'll bring it up. So if you're like, okay, I might need to flash bomb this guy, press you, press use item, it's brought up. Next time you press use item, instantly throw a flash bomb. You know, if you press attack. And you, you know, you don't have anything up. It will instantly bring up the dagger, and you know, you could argue that maybe it should be the blackjack instead. But you know, you can instantly change. Actually, no, I would argue it should be the dagger because if you are suddenly fighting, you'll want the dagger, not the blackjack. Now, in on the subject of fighting and such, is of course you still have a bow. And arrows. It's it's very much the the hawk eye kind of yeah. How many many different types of arrow? Around half a dozen or so. And basically, you know, you have the the regular raw head arrows, and I believe you can still pick them up after you used if they didn't like you know if they just hit. Yeah, I, I didn't get, I didn't try that too much, but a hint said that it did, and the hints did not really lead me astray. So yeah, so that appears to still be possible. But yeah, broadhead arrows for just you know sniping. Then you have, and and you still have some zoom on the, you know, if if you're really tightening the bow, yeah, it's it's ready to. You know, it'll, it'll zoom in to give you a closer look. And you can still, if you change your mind about shooting, I think it's the jump key. Just press that, and it, it won't force you to go through with, with the shot. You know, take the broad shot is not what this game tells you. But yes, the, the other ones, you have a fire arrow, which is less rockety this time around, which I appreciate it. That was that was one of the awkward. I keep saying negative things about. It will light the you know it's it's very powerful against enemies. It does still have a little bit of a rocket thing going on, but it can also light these puddles of oil, which you know enemies are not going to want to walk through that. So you can sort of again didn't really get around. I, I didn't use this too much, but. The hints told me, and they did not lead me astray in any in any of the things that I 
digged around to, to try and but yeah, you can sort of keep them from walking past, the, you know, through an area with them, and just throwing oil. Basically, it's it's one of the items that you 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 know you throw oil, little glass of oil, onto the ground, splashes out, and enemies will slip on that if it's not on fire, you know. So yeah, and. I suppose I should maybe also mention you also have holy water again, and this time it's not that you're dipping arrows in it, water arrows, which I'll get to, in it to then fire at zombies undead. It's that you throw the little flask thing, and it will again leave a puddle. And you can then try to lure undead into that. And yeah, and the thing with this is you don't have all that many of them. It's a fairly limited carry capacity, which I approve. But the, yeah, it won't last on the ground. I, th I think you can go only carry five bottles at any one time. And if you throw it, you best hurry up and lure some zombies into under into that thing. I know it's not politically correct to say zombie anymore. I'm I'm still adjusting. You can lure some undead into that, and you'll definitely want to do that fast before it evaporates. So so yeah. Back to the arrows. The you have the moss arrow, which leaves a basically a, a small pile of moss, which is then basically silent to walk over. And if you shoot it at the chest of an enemy, it'll temporarily choke them. So yeah, some of these arrows now have more uses, like the fire arrow. I believe the choking thing is also new. The water arrow, which puts out fire, which is really useful for putting out torches and like now, did I mention some guards literally carry a torch for you, and that makes it really difficult to hide in the shadows where, where they walk, which if, if they don't, you can pretty much, as long as you don't touch an enemy, he can walk right past you. As, you, know, you can also now hug a wall, because walls need love too, and yeah, make yourself very small, he can walk right past where you're standing, yeah, makes it easy to either sneak past him or knock him out, or you know what have you. Back to the water, and unfortunately, if you move in, you know, at the wrong angle, it'll disengage. Which, for my money, it's always that you should press the button to disengage from something like that. It shouldn't just accidentally do it. You know, it should you should have to press the button, and then it should just be immediate when you press the button. But anyway, back to the the arrows. The water arrow will also grow out the moss and wipe away blood. So very useful if you are the killing sort. And the and then you have the noise arrow. Baby, it's a firework, and yeah, basically it you know it provides some noise and some light. It it will distract and lure them into the area where you fire it to, and then you also have gas arrows which can knock out a small group. And in the distraction, kind of on that subject, you can still pick up pretty much anything that you would expect to be able to pick up. Uh, you know, books, loaves of bread, goblets, you know, of fire or otherwise. And once you have picked them up, you can then drop them, which is by just, you know, with the interact key. Or you can throw them with the attack key, so that's still very... And, and again, the the different materials is again very useful. If you take a goblet and you throw it onto metal, 
that's going to attract attention. Whereas if you're just you're carrying, you know, something small and you throw it and it just hits like wood or maybe even carpet, yeah, that's not going to make too much noise. And like I said, nothing really gets added to, you know, only the things that are objective items that you're, for example, stealing, that gets put in the menu. Loot also just gets put in the menu, and keys also just in the menu. Only the items you pick up that you're going to be using to, you know, fend off or flee from someone gets put in the, you know, item scrolling thingamajig. And I suppose that does bring me nicely to the, the, the interacting itself. Basically, it is now somewhat easier to tell if you, you know, if what you're looking at is something that will be added to your memory or if you pick it up. A, a good example is the book. If a book is closed, it means pick it up. If a book is open, it means read it. And if it is glinting, it means it's loot. Now, the glinting is a really good idea in theory. I really like, I do, I really like that they did do something to help you tell if what you're looking at is loot or not. But the problem is that you can only, it's difficult to tell from up close. It glints from further away. And again, I just wish that when you're just looking at it up close, about to interact, that the light from interacting would shine in a different light. It's turquoise usually, maybe just make it gold for loot. You know, that would, that would help a lot, but still, it is very useful to, you know, and another thing is, you know, some, some candles, candle, can, candelabras, those thingies, some of those are loot, and some of those you just pick up. So you'll definitely want to try to determine that before you sneak all the way there, only to find out it was the other thing. Because in either case, you might have been looking for the other thing. And that, yes, to, to cover how you interact, for those who haven't played these games before, it's still that you center view on the the item that you want to interact with and you know no matter what it is and then it'll be lit with with the the teal light and then you press interact and then you interact with it however you know button you press it item you maybe pick it up so on and so forth. Now something that's really useful. I've already mentioned that you can like leave doors open. This also goes for some some areas have like these big I guess stone ovens, you know, those big kind of if that's open, there's a lot of light coming from there. If it's closed, not so. And yeah, you can you know if it's open you can close it. If it's closed you can open it to attract attention just by was that supposed to be like that? And, you know, closing it, if it's open, also means less light, making it easier to sneak through. Yeah, and you can, you can put out a, what's it called, a, a candle, just with your fingers, you know, walking close, not a water here. And after you've done that, you can then pick up the, the candle thingy and you can then throw it to distract. So you just turn what might have revealed you into something that helps you. And that's, you know, that's the beauty of the physics engine. Almost anything can be a great aid or a great problem for you, you know, a great obstacle. And that is the brilliance that it that is thief. That's part of the brilliance that is thief. Among the things that make up the brilliance that is thief. 
And I suppose that more or less covers the item and interacting system. And this brings, uh, as far as physics goes, you know, this does also have better physics than the first two. And among this is the Havoc engine. So you literally do have Ragdoll in this. Now, the difficulty settings, there are four total. And basically, it determines how much, you know, the percentage of the loot that you have to get before you can accomplish the mission. You know, anywhere from 30% to 90%. You know, how well enemies fight, how much damage the player takes, you know, how perceptive enemies are. And I suppose that might more or less cover the difficulty settings. And, and sometimes there are special restrictions, such as not killing non-combatants and the like. Now, the game is 29 and a half hours long, where the first was 34 hours and the second was 40 hours. So that, that does kind of point to me. It's, it's, it is the weakest of the three overall. But at least with time, it's, it's not by that much. Now this, you do still have the, the zoom ability of the mechanical eye, which I won't give away what the exact circumstances are surrounding that. And now it's night vision, which is really cool. And that's, again, that's basically something they wrap from. They, they, put in there from Deus Ex and makes sense. I, I can totally see, you know, adding night vision to the end. It's a great help. It's where before it was mostly that it, you know, it was like it's instead of walking all the way there, you can now zoom. Now it also has the added benefit of, yeah, brightening the area. And while it might at first sound like that makes it too easy, it doesn't. It's it's just a help. So yeah, the scouting orbs are gone. Where you know one might have expected them to just make it, you know, a remote controlled now, you know, maybe small flying kind of thing. Maybe even add an EMP blast to it, since that's what Deus Ex 1 and 2 had. And I know, you know, it wouldn't be Thief, but a lot of what they did add from Deus Ex is not Thief. Now, this does still live up to, it's easy to just sit down and play. There's not a lot of keys to memorize. It's not very complicated sort of yeah there's there's not a lot you need to know in order to play it but it does take a lot of practice to get good at it but yeah you know once you, you know like I mentioned the, the physics you've got the, the shadow noise system that's about what you really need to know other than that it's just first-person shooter, you know, camera angle and controls and the like. So, yeah. Now, the... At one point, a... a Garrett takes a detour to Silent Hill. Just, just for one level. It's a well-done level. Absolutely. But... It's, it's a very decidedly straight up haunted kind of thing. And there's a personal ghost story. I'm, I'm sorry, it's a Silent Hill level. It's a fairly, well, I mean, for Silent Hill, it's a bit 
obvious, but you know, because a lot of this particular game is not that complex. I, I really wish they wouldn't explain so much of, of puzzles and goals. Yeah, they're they're mainstreaming it. Mainstream lining it. Mainlining it. And yeah, I I I would have liked for that level to just be in a sound game. It really doesn't fit here. And I suppose that more or less covers that. If the you you do no longer you at no point in this do you have to just try out different paths or different doors in order to find a way. You can get lost if you're not paying attention, but this doesn't have, you know, there's no goal marker or radar. There's no radar at all. You yourself have to keep track of where are the enemies and, and such. And the maps, they don't really get increasingly made the way they did, but they do, they don't tell you everything. They, they give you sort of an overall idea of, okay, you know, it'll, it'll mark north, which the first game actually had one. What was it the second? I gotta play the first two again. Anyway, it'll mark north and it'll say, you know, okay, so this is the kitchen, this is the armory, such and such. And as you're going through, you can tell, okay, Pots and pans, oven. pretty sure this is the kitchen. And then you're really surprised when you see the weapons laying around. You know, guard comes in looking to train. No, obviously you, you can tell based on the, yeah. But this game also has a lot of signage. And again, it's one of these things where in Deus Ex it makes sense because there are so many different areas. And maps can be really vague of just an area. You may have to just explore in order to find out the overall. Like, you may know where you're supposed to go overall, but you don't know a lot of the areas surrounding it. And yeah. Now, I suppose you, the, the game does not really judge what you're doing. You can knock out and kill basically as many as you like. It will tell you there's, you know, a stats screen after you've completed a mission and you, yeah, it'll, it'll list all the ones. There's no deducting of points. There's no, Garrett, how could you? None of that. You know, Garrett himself will say, I'm a thief, not a murderer. But you can make a complete liar out of him on in that statement. The, the consequences are very direct. Like, you know, if, if you're noticed, you got to run or fight. And, yeah. Now the, but but yeah. Also, in addition to that way of showing stats, the city, which by the way you tend to return to each time you complete a mission, and you can then explore. You, you can go about it at your own pace. The way you also can with the levels, but at least the levels have very clear story focus. And always, I'm getting. I already covered that. Yeah, you, you tend to return to the city in between each mission, but the city, the different areas of the city have the guard houses, barracks kind of thing, and there will be a crime report posted on there. Now, I, I'm not certain, but I think it might actually be entirely dedicated to Garrett, which it makes me all warm and fuzzy inside. It, it literally, I don't think it has any other crime. Actually, I guess there are no other criminals in the, I mean, you, you come across the occasional, like, you know, guy who was up to no good, kind of 
but it's it's pretty rare, which again compared to the earlier ones, and again it's why you maybe don't do open world when you can't. That's actually that does bring me into when people in this game realize they've been pickpocketed, they'll respond different ways. Like I mentioned, the civilian might call a guard or the like. A guard will, you know, grab a sword, look around. I know I was counting something a second ago, you know. And at one point I stole, I pickpocketed a, you know, yeah, a higher goon, something like that. When he realized he killed indiscriminately those around him, because he's like, did you take it? And yeah, that makes sense. That and that also happened in in the first game. So I, I grew. I suppose the 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 mist denoting that you are going into a new area does also limit the amount of different paths you can take in you know different routes between areas. The rope arrows are gone. But fear not, my dear fellows, for they have been replaced with the climbing clothes. And these are pretty cool. Basically, to briefly compare them, they are faster than the rope arrow and similarly limited. Where the rope arrows can be fired into any wooden surface and then, you know, shoot out a rope for you to climb. You now have a, a set of gloves which allow you to Spider-Man up and down stone, sheer vertical stone surfaces. And it, you know, you can't do the Assassin's Creed style attack from above. It wouldn't really fit either. You can hide up there if, you know, enemies might not look up above if, you know, I mean, their, their sight lines fairly straightforward. So that's one option. You can sometimes get to an area quicker. I, I bypassed a set of stairs at one point. You can't really round corners, which you should be able to in real life, but you can cross some, you know, smaller angles. It can sometimes be a little difficult to tell if you can climb, you know, if you can climb past something or not, and whether or not you should climb. And that's, again, that's something that sometimes happens with special abilities in games, and it's really unfortunate. It, it shouldn't happen, you know. The... I suppose that one of those covers... And yeah, and sometimes it'll provide different route, different routes to. There, there was one building where, you know, I could go in through the front door, but could also scale the wall, and then there's a hatch that you open. And lost flashbacks, notwithstanding, it did provide a different path into the the building. And I think that more or less covers the climbing gloves. So yeah, that is definitely a, a change which is pretty cool. And you know, obviously you, you do want to change around things with sequels. I suppose that more or less covers when you look down you can see your arms and legs if you know if it makes sense to you know, if you've got a weapon drawn, you can see your arms by looking down. And you can almost always see your feet and legs and such. Now, the Pagans and the Hammerites... Actually, I suppose that does me more or less... Yeah, actually, I, I think I have covered those enough. Now the the HUD remains minimal and you do have to 
yeah, you, you yourself have to just cover that, cover the gap there. Again, disempower, disempowering in the good way. I think that I was a little worried that they would bring in the more significant role-playing game elements of Deus Ex into this, which, I mean, the first two is just, you know, potions and these these arrows that you can use. And there is no upgrading. There is no, you know, special ability kind of thing. They did not. They did not mess around with that. I mean, there there are there are things you get to do at certain points in this that, you know, the, the, the keepers, excuse me, imbue you with the ability to see, excuse me, and activate their door glyphs, which is basically, there are these hidden doors all around the city, and you can now open them, and it provides shortcuts, and, yeah, there's... There are maybe one or two areas of the city that are off limits for one reason or another. Then maybe the keepers could let you get into. But you know, we're not talking straight up upgrading or yeah. Which again, I love that in Deus Ex and System Shock 2, but it's it's not Thief. And again, that's why Deus Ex needs bases which you can that you can go to between missions and why Thief really doesn't. You know, as just a quick example, in Deus Ex 1, second one, in Deus Ex 1, you pick up these canisters for upgrading, and in the first one, you can't just do it by yourself, because how would you even, in the first one, you have to get to, there, there are these two robots, and one of them can fully heal you, and the other can fully recharge the energy you use to activate these canisters once you've had them surgically, you know, yeah. And you can also upgrade these also at the, the robot. I think it's the healing robot. Again, it's been too long. I, I really have got to replay some of these old games. Old. In, in in video gaming terms. And, yeah. That covers that. I suppose that more or less... Now, the, the, the lock picking, you... It now automatically brings it up. This is another thing that before you had to scroll to and I feel it worked fine in those, but I do also like that in this, it, it automatically brings it up when you right-click on a locked door or chest. I do wish that it would highlight just the lock. Sometimes I thought I would be opening something because I hadn't quite spotted the lock. But yeah, it's basically... It, it still stores your progress and you can still disengage from lockpicking at any point. And in this one, you disengage, and also puts the lockpicks away again. And bringing them up or putting them away takes maybe a second total. So, yeah, no irritating pause between you starting the action and it actually doing the action in this for that. And the lockpicking is now essentially prototype Splinter Cell lock picking. You move the mouse around to try to find the, I think the game calls it the sweet spot. And then once you found one sweet spot, it will proceed on the lock to the next sweet spot and so on and so forth. The stronger the lock, the more sweet spots you have to find. Yeah. And obviously being discovered when you're unlocking when you're lockpicking, they're not going to like that that much. Now, home is where the practice is. If you go to Garrett's home place, you can practice shooting 
you know, firing arrows. You have a a dummy which I guess you can you know attack with the dagger. It doesn't do a whole lot, but sure, you know, it's yeah, you you can do it. And best of all, it has locks, and you can I think it starts with just the one, and then over the course of the game you can buy it at shops. You also yourself have to buy the climbing gloves. And for a while, they are just a benefit, not something you have to have. But, you know, yeah, eventually you will need them. The game itself will make sure you're not suddenly stuck somewhere without, you know, being able to buy them. But, yeah, actually I suppose you might even be able to run out of money for me. But then... You know, if you if you spend too much, then the game will, you know, save every so often. Actually, I ran into some bugs in this, so I ended up having to save often anyway. And I suppose the that more or less covers that. But but yeah, you can buy stronger locks and then practice on them in Garrett's home so you know with no pressure and you can just yeah try to get gooder with it. And I suppose that might more or less you f you will find in this that nobody can swim to save their life. Like literally Touching water deep enough to swim in instantly kills you. You are not, however, a science alien because small puddles and the like will not harm you. Now, I suppose that might more or less come. You still can't, you still aren't assured the ability to disengage a ladder or the climbing gloves quietly, again, yeah. I, I wish that the climbing gloves, that you would have a proper visual cue the way you have for the blackjack and the dagger for when you backstab someone. It really is about corporatism now. Yeah, because really some, there are times where I jumped into a wall expecting to be able to climb it, and alas, it was not meant to be. And then there were times where I really didn't expect him to climb, but there he went. And the, yeah, the climbing also, if you touch, touch the ground, it will, I don't know what that's about, it will, Unclimb, it will disengage climb, which again you should just be pressing. Which actually, again, to unclimb, I guess otherwise you basically have to jump. There were times where jumping made more sense than touching the ground for one reason or another. And yeah, I'm, I'm jumping, I might accidentally jump to the wrong. Yeah, so that that doesn't exactly help. You can climb, you know, up something, you know, like vault is maybe the word, and, you know, from, from climbing with logs, you know, from a vertical surface to a horizontal surface, and it'll, it'll sort of start by peaking up, and then you can climb. I wish that you could just bypass the, the peaking, like maybe just, you know, if you click interact, It'll peak, and you know from there you can climb up. If you don't click it right, you'll just climb up. I wish you would do it. It was not so, and the uh, yeah the, the you can still vault. It's still jumping and holding down the jump. It still doesn't have a visual cue. This is another thing where they really should have put in a visual cue, and. Yeah, I you accidentally jump when you thought you might vault, and vice versa. It's very unfortunate. Basically, if you're standing very close to 
a horizontal surface which is just over, you might vault it by pressing jump. And I suppose that might more or less cover it. Now, the some of the more surreal and twisted kind of double take moments are really yeah completely eliminated here like again that's where the that's something that was really a big thing in the in the cutscenes in the first two and also very much the you know, the pagan territories and such, which in this has almost no buildup and really don't feel enough like just you're surrounded by a living, chaotic nature. It's, yeah, that's, that's a huge loss. That is very, yeah. And I suppose I pretty well covers everything. The the ending is pretty good and really once the story does get going, I mean overall it's not really bad for Thief. It's just kind of there are a lot of good ideas here for Thief. And it just doesn't quite, you know, a lot is lost because of the Deus Ex approach. And, yeah, it's, it's not, you know, if you're a purist, you'll probably want to, you know, bypass it. I, I had fun. I enjoyed myself playing this, and it does, I mean, the, the core gameplay is there. In some ways it's better, in some ways it's slightly worse, but they didn't completely, you know, yeah, it's, some of the essence is still very much intact. And again, it's not a bad game, it just has a number of problems, especially when you try to, like, like I said, it's, it's kind of bland. It's not quite Deus Ex, it's not quite Thief. So, yeah, I believe that pretty well covers it. I've reviewed other parts of this series, the links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.